What's the most important thing people should do before they talk to news outlets about their organization's crisis? I'm Edward Siegel, a leadership strategy senior contributor for Forbes.com and author of the best-selling and award-winning book, Crisis Ahead, 101 Ways to Prepare for and Bounce Back from Disasters, Scandals, and Other Emergencies. My guest today is Ed Barks, a communications strategy consultant, author, and president of Barks Communications. He'll discuss how and why media training is so important before organizations have a crisis, and he'll share his insights on how that training can help companies and government agencies communicate about any crisis situation. Welcome to the Crisis Ahead podcast, Ed. Glad you could be with me today. Thanks, Edward. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. How can spokespeople uh, improve their media and interview skills, especially before their government agencies or companies have to deal with a crisis? Yeah, that's really important. And it's all about sustained professional development. You know, it's not a one shot deal where you can get all the knowledge, all the information, all the skills you need in one fell swoop. And a lot of times you will hear people say, well, so and so has been media trained. Well, that's a canard in my view. It, it's, it's an ongoing process. So it's, it's a program you have to set up, whether it's your CEO, whether it's spokespeople in certain issue areas, but you've got to have and maintain a program to get your spokespeople up to skill, up to skill levels, and also to get them familiar with your message so they can internalize it in order to verbalize it. So one, one is required before you can do the other. Is that right? Well, and it, it, it's you, you need to have a system for understanding if a crisis strikes, what can you do, what might you need to do to communicate to your stakeholders about that crisis. It, you know, it, it, it's not so much a matter of knowing what the exact crisis will be, because, I mean, none of us have accurate crystal balls. But it, it's a matter of having a, a process in place so that you've at least got a basic framework for understanding what you need to do, who needs to do what, and when it needs to happen. I know you've referred to in the past uh, that an exchange with a reporter is similar to a business deal. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, it, it very much is similar to, uh, I'll use the analogy of going into a grocery store to buy a loaf of bread. You know, you want the bread, the store wants your money, you make that exchange. Now, with a reporter, it, it's obviously a little different, and, and we're hoping you're not exchanging money with reporters. It's a matter of exchanging information. You have information the reporter wants. The reporter, in exchange, is willing to give you some airtime or some ink time to get across your message to the public. So in that sense, it's very much a business deal. Does that change, do you think, uh, when a uh, source is dealing with a crisis and the reporter really wants to get that story, or does that put more of a, a fine point on the uh, uh, business uh, arrangement? Well, it, it, you still have to remember that it's a professional transaction and, and not to take anything personally. Yes, reporters, we use different tactics. Some may try to get under your skin. Some may play dumb, any range of tactics. It's up to you as the spokesperson in the midst of a crisis to know what you can say, what you cannot say, either because it's 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 uh, you know it's something that's confidential or you just don't know at that point. You don't have perfect information. So you need to understand what you can say and who should be saying that. What's more important, do you think, for new sources that they have a coherent message uh, or basic solid communication skills? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes to both. Uh, you know, you really need uh, both of those elements to be a successful communicator. And, and I, I hark back to some work I did with the head of a federal cabinet level department. Um, she had uh, gotten through her office grapevine that I had done some work with some of her deputies with respect to media strategy and training for some initiatives they were about to roll out. And I guess the conversation with her deputies went something like, I want some of that too. So 
she came back, you know, we had a session with her one-on-one initially, then brought some of her deputies in to kind of uh, uh, buttress things. And, you know, I've always thought she was a marvelous example of that commitment to sustained professional development because she was a, a stellar communicator. She had no issues that were evident at all in terms of negatives. However, she still wanted to get better. And it takes that kind of commitment, no matter whether you're the head of a federal agency, the CEO of a corporation, or a a manager who has responsibility for communicating with the public. You've got to keep that in mind that you can always get better. Well, a crisis situation can impose a lot of pressure uh, on companies, organizations, and government agencies. Uh, Let's say you're meeting with a reporter who's covering a crisis situation. Um, what's the most important thing for that spokesperson to remember? Well, there's there's a, a number of things. First of all, you have to do your research. Has the reporter covered this issue before? Have they been covering it for long standing? Are they perhaps new to the beat on the other hand? What's the publication like? Does it tend to be confrontational or is it fairly straight edge reporting? So you, you need to do that kind of research to have an understanding of who you're talking to, what their readership or listenership or viewership is like, and go from there and tailor your message accordingly. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that you say entirely different things to different audiences, but for instance, you may be able to dig a little deeper with a, a, a technical publication, whereas with a general circulation newspaper, you're, you're just going to have to keep things fairly vanilla and fairly easy to, to comprehend for you know folks like me who, as I like to say in my media training workshops, I play the dummy test. I don't know your issues like you do if you're an expert in, in whatever it may be but I can tell you how it's going to land. And that's important to keep in mind. Who are you talking to? Who's that audience? Well, based on the research that you do before the interview, and based on what you find out from that research, do you think it's advisable for people to decline an offer to be interviewed by a specific news organization if they don't think it's a good fit or they have uh, issues or concerns with uh, the reporter or the news outlet? Yeah, perhaps. And and that obviously has to happen on a case by case basis. Uh, If you're concerned with, for instance, uh, it may be that that confrontational type of interview, or maybe you just don't have the spokespeople to who are up to speed to deal with something like that. You might try issuing a statement instead. And and when you I'm, I'm going to offer some advice, I don't care if you're a government agency, a corporation, a nonprofit, if you issue a statement, please attach an individual's name to it. It doesn't need to be the CEO, though it well can be. But don't don't ever issue a statement, which we see sometimes, so-and-so company said. Well, companies don't talk. People talk. So have a representative of your company. Have that name attached to any statement that you release. Well, speaking of talking, we've all heard terms like off the record and on background when spokespeople uh, talk to reporters. Um, what do those phrases mean and how useful are they today? Well, they're, they're useful in the hands of experienced communicators. And, and I, would, uh, I would wholeheartedly recommend that if you are an expert who does not have frontline responsibilities with media relations, do not try to negotiate terms like off the record, on background, not for attribution. Leave that to your communications professionals because they know, or at least they ought to know, the background of all those. And then make sure you define that with a reporter. And let me give you an example. When I worked in association life a number of years ago, we always preferred that that the quotes in a a, a periodical article or the, the, uh, the footage on TV would come from one of our members. We wanted to push the members out front. Now, as the chief media person, I would talk to reporters all day gladly, well, gladly for the most part in most cases, on background. And what that meant was they could use anything I gave them, anything I said to them, any materials that I forwarded to them, but they could not attach my name to it. However, the deal was, I'll get you a quote. It's just not going to come from me. It's going to come from one of our members because they are the face of the organization. And that's really the way it should be in any type of membership organization. And what happens after a story is published uh, or printed or broadcast and the spokesperson notices a mistake or an inaccuracy 
in the reporting? Um, what should they do? First line of defense would be to call the contact the reporter. You can call, you can email, you can text, whatever you how whatever your relationship with that reporter dictates, and try to get some satisfaction there. Uh, if the reporter simply is is you know intransigent, doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to do anything with it. Well, then you can go to an editor or a news director. But I would always start with that reporter and give them the courtesy of of your call because perhaps they just didn't quite understand. Maybe you didn't explain it as cogently as you might. So give that reporter the first chance. When a spokesperson does decide to talk to a reporter, what do you think the best question a spokesperson might hear uh, from that reporter? Uh, I, you know, I always like to feed reporters questions. And, and again, if you have a situation where you're a larger organization and you have a dedicated communications or media relations staff, have them forward some questions to the reporter. You know, here are some issues that have come up. Here are some other questions we have heard. And it's not necessarily that the reporter will go down that list of questions verbatim, although some do, and, and that's to your benefit, of course, but it gives them a sense of what you want to talk about. And hopefully they will cover some of those issues that, that, that are what I like to call the friendly type of questions. Do some organizations have rules, though, against accepting questions in advance for reporters? Or do spokespersons run the risk of offending or turning off a reporter if they are trying to feed questions to them in advance of an interview? Yeah, some reporters won't won't take them, and that's okay. Um, but it, it's still within your purview as a communicator to forward those types of questions to the reporter. If they use them, great. If they don't, you haven't lost anything. Well, there's different ways, of course, to convey information uh, in addition to what is uh, written or said. Uh, talk about, if you will, Ed, the importance of nonverbal signals when government officials or corporate executives are being interviewed about a crisis situation? Yeah, nonverbal signals are, are really crucial because that, that can be a large part of your communications efforts and a large part of the way your, your public you're trying to reach during a crisis or, or simply during any kind of, of media outreach. That's how they're, they are going to perceive you. So let me give you an extreme example. If a reporter asks a question that just throws you totally for a loop and you do something like, Okay, that's that's a pretty good nonverbal indicator that that they've hit on something that's very sensitive, and you can bet that reporter is going to keep following up on that. However, if you can look and sound engaged from a nonverbal perspective, if your pitch is is accurate, if your volume is is uh, modulated right, uh, if your actions are are appropriate to the situation, then you're going to be able to, to kind of open that audience up to be more receptive to your message. And, and that's the ultimate. I mean, nonverbals are, are an important part, but really what it boils down to is getting your message out to the public. I know you've written several books, uh, one of which recently was uh, Reporters Don't Hate You. Uh, I've read it. It's a great read. And I know it has uh, more than 100 different media relations tips um, how do you come up so with uh, so many tips and recommendations and uh, suggestions for people? Long years of toil in the trenches. And, and Edward, thank you for the, the, the kind words about reporters don't hate you. Uh, it, it's, it's just over the years kind of cataloging things that, that I've come across, observations from watching interviews, just you know, sitting, watching the evening news, for example. And of course, from situations that I've been involved with, uh, with clients for 25 plus years for media strategy and media training engagements. So it, it's seeing what works, it's seeing what doesn't work. Work. And, and it's important to understand that what something, a technique that may work for me may be totally antithetical to you and vice versa. So you need to personalize what is going to gain the maximum performance from any spokesperson, again, whether it's in a crisis or whether it's simply some initiative that's being rolled out uh, uh, proactively. I know the book also features a comprehensive glossary of uh, reporter-related terms. Um, what's the importance uh, of that glossary? It, the glossary is important because it, it, it establishes a baseline of understanding between reporter and communicator. So, for example, your, your communications department, your communications staff, 
should be pretty much aware of things that a reporter knows and, and how a reporter defines them. And, and by the way, if, if you're in, especially if you're in a larger organization and you do not have former reporters in your media relations office, get some now, get them today, because they can translate reporterese and reporter language and reporter perspectives to your spokespeople. And that's really a really important understanding to have. Do you think that uh, organizations that don't have former journalists on their staff, that they are putting themselves uh, automatically at a disadvantage uh, when a crisis strikes? Oh, no question. No question. If a reporter has covered any type of crisis in the past and they have decided to uh, go to the communication side as opposed to the reporting side, the journalism side, that's just invaluable perspective and an invaluable experience. They are going to know how that that beast functions in the midst of a crisis. So having those types of former journalists, and I'm again, I'm, I'm not talking about people that are hopping the fence time and time again. Today, I'm a reporter. Tomorrow, I'm a communicator. Now I'm back being a reporter. Now I'm back being a communicator. And the worst of all, I think, are... are and I see this on, on sites like LinkedIn, for example, every now and then, where people say they're a journalist and a consultant. Well, I'm sorry, but you can't be both at the same time. I'll give you one hop across the fence. Um, however, it, it's important that, that former reporters, former reporters be engaged in a communication shop, uh, again, especially in a larger organization that, that, uh, that, that has the wherewithal to have a dedicated media relations uh, presence. Thanks to COVID, uh, a lot of us have had to uh, learn communication skills that we never had to use before, uh, such as uh, Zoom or other online uh, video uh, platforms. Uh, is there a difference uh, in this era of Zoom interviews for how spokespeople uh, conduct interviews with reporters and journalists? Yeah, this is a question I get a lot. What What's changed? And, and I got this a lot, especially when we all started getting used to communicating routinely via Zoom and other uh, video platforms. What has changed? And I'm going to suggest that one thing, one thing has changed, the technology, period, full stop, end of sentence. Yes, we've had to, to do other things surrounding that technology. For example, we've all had to become our own engineers. Our own, we have to have some understanding of how to broadcast, and I use that term advisedly, broadcast clear audio, how to get lighting to our advantage, how to use a background to get across some of the image that we want to get across. And Edward, your perfect example with your book, Crisis Ahead, prominently displayed in your background. So we've all needed to understand a little bit more, but still, I mean, it just boils down to the technology because you still got to keep that sustained professional development attitude. You still got to broadcast a magnetic message and you still have to have the skills to, to deliver that message to your public. For what we're going through today, the increased use and dependency on Zoom and other video platforms, um, is this a new normal or is there anything any more such as normal? Do you see communications efforts ever getting back to pre-pandemic routines? I, I, the answer to that is partially. And let me explain. It, it, what we're seeing more and more, if you watch some of the, the talking heads shows, MSNBC and Fox and CNN and so forth, what you're seeing now is a slow trickling of their talking heads back into the studio. Not everybody and not all the time. However, until a few, maybe two, three months ago, we rarely saw any in-studio interviews. Well, now we're seeing them on a somewhat routine basis. However, there are still a lot of remote interviews being done as well. So I suspect that from any for any number of reasons, uh, ease of being able to uh, contact people and, and plug them into an interview, uh, diversity of viewpoints, and obviously for, uh, for a lot of news organizations, cost savings, they are now turning to Zoom and other video platforms as part of their regular routine. And I, I, I fully anticipate that's going to continue. You just mentioned the cost savings. Uh, 
a lot of companies and organizations and even government agencies for whatever reasons are actually putting off programs such as media and advocacy training. Is there any dangers in uh, postponing those kinds of uh, programs? Oh, you bet. You bet. Uh, if you don't have that kind of, of professional development ongoing routine, then you're going to fall behind the competition. So find a way to do that. Now, some organizations and, and more and more as, as time passes are comfortable with doing the, the you know, kind of in-person one-on-one, which you know, I do a lot of one-on, you know, one, two or three people at a time, very small groups. Uh, or some even, you know, larger conferences. Um, it's, I think it's a matter of personal comfort and a personal uh, understanding of health and safety as we're, we're still in a pandemic, as we you know, speak here, you and I today. Um, however, it, it, it's a matter of trying to figure out what is most comfortable for that organization, for the individuals in the organization. And is it something that can be done effectively? over a remote platform. And, and we've, we've learned a lot over the past three years. Initially, um, I will admit to having a, a bit of a, a rough time seeing how this was going to translate into something that was workable. And today it, it's, it's there, not 100% there, but it's you know getting up towards 70, 80%. So um, things are changing, um, but it's still a matter of, of organizational and personal preference in many cases. Well, Ed, you've written uh, four books so far. Why do you write books and what's your next project? Well, you know, it's interesting that the first book I wrote was in 2005. And that was the proverbial book screaming to get out of me. It was called The Truth About Public Speaking. And I, I just, I, I knew I had to write that book. And while I've known I've had to write the, the ensuing three books as well, it, it's, you know, I, I do it because I... I just I enjoy the craft. Um, I enjoy sharing points of view with others who may find them helpful. And frankly, from from as as a as a business person, it, it's it's a business development tool. If I can go into a a company and say, well, you know, they they understand I've written four books, and the people I'm competing against have never written a book. Well, that probably gives me an advantage. So it, it's a matter of getting that information out into the public sphere. And and try to encourage discussion about it. it. It's you know I'm I'm not the the end all and be all expert of anything by any means. I know a lot about some things, but I don't know everything. So if we can engender discussions and debates and and civil debates, of course, um, so much the better. We're almost out of time, unfortunately. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us uh, with your advice, recommendations, or insights today, Ed? Well, you know, I'll tell you, it, 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 I would look for, uh, see how other people and organizations handle crises in terms of the communications aspect of a crisis. Look at, for example, uh, uh, let's take a, a, something that's been in the headlines the last few months, the, the FTX crypto uh, crisis. Uh, now that company collapsed. And when it first did, the CEO, the then CEO, Sam Bankman Fried, was just a, a fountain of quotes in the media. And then it stopped. And then he decided not to talk to anybody. So I, I, I suspect there might have been some lack of strategy there. I don't know. I'm not an insider there. I don't have any specific insights. But my, my outsider's perspective is that there was some lack of strategy. So the point there is, have a strategy in place before the crisis strikes. Again, you're not going to know the exact nature of the crisis ahead of time. If you have, however, that crisis plan, that crisis communications plan in pocket, it's going to be much easier for you to pivot as you need to as your crisis unfolds. All great advice. And I look forward to uh, reading your next book. Uh, thanks again for joining me today, Ed. That's it for this edition of Crisis Ahead. My guest today was Ed Barks, a communications strategy consultant, author, and president of Barks Communications. Be sure to come back next week for more advice and insights on preparing for, managing, and recovering from a crisis, or subscribe to Crisis Ahead wherever you get podcasts. Remember, it's not a matter of if a crisis will hit your organization or company, it's when. And the sooner you are prepared for it, the better. Produced by HeartCast Media.